Thanks for being here at Grace City this morning. I hope, um, hope you're happy to be here this morning. It's, yeah, good. Someone is. That's good. I mean, it's amazing coming together and being able to worship together. I just love that. I just love that we can contribute and have scripture reads and prayers and just, you know, uh, really enjoy God in their ways. I love coming together as the church. It's, it's amazing. And so thank you for being here with us this morning. And so this morning I felt God just stir me in terms of uh, bringing some things that were on my heart. So rather uh, than a, a kind of a preach, but more really just sharing my heart. And they're kind of two key things that um, I felt God speaking to me about and stirring me afresh. They, they're not rocket science, as you'll see, but uh, things that I've just felt God wanting, putting on my heart again over this holiday time uh, and uh, just being uh, enjoying God. And then last week, as um, Chloe was, was speaking, uh, which was, was so great, it was wonderful having her preach on, on worship and stirring us and encouraging us to come to worship, and she she spoke uh, just a little bit. She said uh, something about positioning yourself in the room and when you, you know, come in for worship, where you positioned and how you position yourself, things that won't distract you, things that will help you to engage in worship. And, and then through the week, God has just, uh, that phrase of position yourself has really just stuck with me and kind of pulled together these things that I felt God was putting in my heart. And so, what I bring you this morning is really about us positioning ourselves. Maybe it's repositioning ourselves this morning. And that's always a good thing to do at the start of a year as we consider the year. And so I feel like God wants us to be repositioned. He wants us uh, to be positioned uh, in the right way for Him. You know, like sunflowers. I don't know if you've ever seen a field of sunflowers, amazing big yellow heads, and they just, they follow the sun. They just move. The whole field just moves following the sun going across the sky. And we need to position ourselves like that. We need to be positioned to receive from God. We need to be positioned uh, where God wants us. Uh, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what job you do, uh, no matter whether these are good times, difficult times, God wants us to position up ourselves in the right way. And so I feel like these things in my heart, I feel like they're a call to us from God. I feel like they also can be a warning from God, as well as an encouragement to press on into God. So I feel it's those three, three things, really, a calling, an encouragement, but also a warning, really, of how are we positioning ourselves? Where are we positioning ourselves? So my first point, and really the key thing, I want to say about positioning ourselves is that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Everything else is secondary. Everything else, even about church life, everything else about uh, how we live is secondary to Jesus. Jesus is the key. He is the one that it's all about. And I've been reading Revelation uh, recently and you read Revelation, and actually, you know, there, there's all the stuff we don't understand and prophecies, but actually you read it, it's all about Jesus, actually. Again and again, it's Him being relieved, who can re reveal, who can open the seals, who is this Lamb, who's going to have victory at the end of the day, who's going to be the one on the, the white horse. It's all actually about Jesus, about who He is, and actually what that's going to mean for us in the future. And we need to be captivated again with Jesus, not even what He has done for us. And what He's done for us is immense. Even as we were enjoying in our worship, as Gillian read that great scripture, you know, about His lavish grace and His love for us. And that is amazing, but actually, it's not even that that needs to grasp us. It's actually Jesus Himself that needs to take hold of us. It's Jesus himself that needs to captivate us. Not even what he's done, not even this amazing place of freedom that he's brought us into. Not even the things that he's called us to do, the way we can serve, the way we can see 
nations change, the way Joel can see people hungry you know, for God at a, at a funeral. It's not even those things, the way that we can do those things and God works through us, but it's actually just Jesus. It is Jesus, the person that is meant to be everything to us. And if we read in Revelation 2 about the church in Ephesus, I think it's really helpful for us. And this is what the angel to the church in Ephesus says in chapter 2 from verse 2. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. What a commendation. And I would take that as a commendation if that was said over me. That my deeds have been awesome, what I've done for God. My hard work has been seen by God. My hard work, my perseverance despite hardship and struggle, I've persevered. But then it says, yet, yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. You have forsaken the love you had at first. This first love, you know, when we fall in love with someone, that first period is amazing. Well, give me some things to describe when you fall in love. How, how do you feel? What happens? Shout some things out to you. When you're first in love with someone. Giddy. Giddy. Oh, there's a good word, Scott. Giddy. It's like, ah, oh, this is just amazing. I'm giddy with love. Yeah, what else someone said? What else? Scott's always giddy. Sorry? Selfless. Selfless. Yeah, suddenly this person is amazing. And you think, wow, I just want to do what I can for this person. Yeah, you, you kind of feel less about yourself. Devoted, was it? Devoted, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. You're devoted to this person. You, you're kind of captivated by them. And, you know, the sun and moon and stars just shine out of their eyes. And you are totally devoted. Yeah. Yeah, that's how you feel. You feel this person can't do anything wrong. You feel what? Good job, Wes. Good job. <laughs> it's not a competition. <laughs> Anything else? Happy? Something else? Can't bear to be apart. Absolutely, you just you just want to be with this person all the time. I, I've um, I've loved the story my my mum and dad or my mum's really told of when they first met. So my mum's 92. My dad died a few years ago. But so they met at the end of the Second World War. So my dad had been in service and he knew my, my mum's brother who was also away serving in the war. And my dad got back uh, from the war first and um, he had met my mum before. Uh, and so he'd remembered her and he started to go and visit her house. And so he would go and he would say, oh, has... Uh, Charles, her brother, has he, has he come back yet from, from the war? That's why he was going there, supposedly, you know. And obviously, uh, my mum's mum would say no, and so then he would talk a bit to my mum. And then my mum's gran kept saying, uh, what does this guy keep coming around for? He knows that Charles hasn't come back for Why does he keep coming around? But he couldn't be, bear to be a pass. He just wanted to be there all the time. And then eventually, obviously, they got got together. And we feel like that when we first meet someone and we, we're in love. We just, we can't bear to be apart. We feel happy. We feel this joy and delight. And that is what the Christian life is about. That is actually what God is calling us again to come back to this first love, to that love. It's not coming to duty, coming to what we feel we should be doing, the way we should be acting. It's coming to this first love. 
This love that has total focus on the one that we love, Jesus. We are totally captivated. We have total focus on Jesus. And everything else is secondary. Everything else, you know, falls to the side. And we feel this wholeheartedness. It's one of our, our words of culture that we want in the church. Wholeheartedness. And when we first in love, we feel a whole, our whole heart. Our whole heart is given to this person. And there's no room for anything else. Our whole heart is given. And that's the call on us today is to wholeheartedly love the person of Jesus. That everything else can't fit, actually. There's not any room for anything else, really, because it's just Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And it sounds over the top, because what about my wife and my kids and all the people that I love? Well, actually, they're going to be totally loved if I am wholeheartedly loving Jesus. If I am giving everything to Him. If there is a passion within me as we were singing. There's that excitement to see the person. You can't wait to see them again. When are you next going to be there? When are you next going to meet that person? When, when are you next going out on a date? When are you going to see each other again? Maybe it's less so these days because we're in constant contact with texting and wherever, whatever you're using to be in contact. But I guess in my day, dare I say it, we didn't have that. And so there was more excitement to wait and see this person. How excited were you to come to church this morning? Were you excited? Or was it like, oh, Sunday, yeah. Well, we go to church on a Sunday. Come on, kids, get ready. Okay, I'll drag myself out of bed. It was a late night. But I'll, you know, I know I should go. I know it'll be good for me. Or was there excitement and passion? Because you're going to the lover of your soul. You're going to the one who has your heart. You're going to meet with the one who totally has you, who you're captivated by. When you go to read the Bible or when you go to pray, how do you feel? It's a spiritual discipline. I know I have to do it. I know I have to do it. Or is it, wow, I get to spend time. I get to spend time with my lover. I get to spend time with the one who I have a love affair with. It's so different and it's so important for us to position us in this way. It's very easy for our relationship to become mundane. The shine comes off it. Uh, that can happen in, in marriage. You know, suddenly you're not captivated by this person anymore and the little things that they did that used to be kind of quaint are now totally irritating and annoying. <laughs> Do we feel that way with God? I remember when I was first saved, um, and I was not from a church background, and first saved, and going to church was just the most exciting thing. I would go whenever I could, so much so that I was at university at the time in Cape Town, and um, there, was, uh, there was a group of Christians that were meeting in a place called Rhodes Memorial. If anyone's from Cape Town, they'd know it. It's up on the mountainside, and uh, it's this memorial to, to Rhodes, and it's got this big statue at the top. It's a massive flight of stairs that kind of goes down the mountain with big lions on the side. And it, it faces across the Cape Flats, facing, um, facing east, and then the mountains in the distance. And the sun comes up over there, and so we'd meet at 5 a.m. while it was dark and start to worship on the steps, and the sun would come up. It was amazing, but 5 a.m. these days, I don't like early mornings. But I was so passionate. I was just wanting to spend all the time I could with God's people and with God. How do we feel about that? Is the shine come off? Do we feel a bit dull when we think of God's I felt God give me two 
words that he wanted to challenge this morning. They are skeptical and cynical. I believe God wants to break skepticism and cynicism this morning. Where you've grown cynical about church, where you've grown cynical about God. Yeah, I know we say all those things and we sing these things, but really, I don't know if he really acts. I'm not really sure if he heals. There's cynicism that's crept in. You've grown skeptical. It's just, it's just not as good. I'm skeptical. People stand up, give testimonies. Yeah, that's okay for them. But I don't see that in my life. I believe God wants to deal with cynicism and skepticism this morning. Those two things. And you know how he deals with them? He deals with them not by hitting us with a stick, but by capturing us again with him. That's how he deals with it. By drawing our hearts again to be in love. That's how he deals with these things. There's a naivety, actually, that he wants. You know, naivety is not, it's not a, a, we don't see it as a good quality, really. Oh, they just, they're naive. Actually, I believe there's a naivety that comes, and, and when you're first in love, there is a naivety with this person. They, they're perfect. They can't do anything wrong. And there's a naivety. Well, actually, Jesus is perfect, and he hasn't done anything wrong. And so we can be naive. There's a naivety. There's a freshness. There's an innocence when we're totally in love with Him. So I believe He wants to deal with those two things this morning as He draws our heart afresh in love. And this chapter in Revelation, He says that we are to repent and do the things you did at first. Repent and do the things you did at first. In Hebrew, the word repent, it actually means to return. It means to return. That's what repentance is. It's, we know it's turning away, but it, it's to return to where you were before. And so he's calling them and calling us to our first love. He's saying, return to it. That's, that's what repentance is. He's saying that there are other things that have started capturing your heart. There are other things that have grown up and, and become things that, that your heart is more drawn to. And he's saying, return, repent, return to your first love, to Jesus. Return to Jesus. That's what repentance is. It's returning back to that first love. Repentance isn't sackcloth and ashes as we see in the Old Testament. What, what it is here is it's a returning to the love of Jesus. It's returning to Jesus, and that's his call on us as a church. It's a call on us not just as Grace City Church, but as the church in Australia. If we're going to see this nation change, then we need to repent. We need to return to set our focus just on Jesus and let him captivate us. We need to return to that. That's what he's calling us to. We've had prophetic words in this church about being a well of hope, a well of hope, that we're going to be a well of hope. Well, the only way we're going to be a well, and ho- a well of hope is if we are captivated by Jesus, if He is the center of everything that we are doing ourselves and as a church. Because in Him, we find hope. It's not in our programs. It's not in all the things we can do. It's in Him that we find hope. He is the well of hope. And so as we've been spoken to prophetically about being well in the hope, we need to repent and return to Him and Him alone, letting our hearts be totally captivated and caught in Him. We need to get back to this love affair. The second thing that I felt God speak to me about was that having set our gaze again on Jesus, we then need to actually walk in the Spirit, as the Bible 
calls us to do. We need to walk in the Spirit. We set our gaze captivated by Jesus. And then we call to live our lives walking in the Spirit. What happens to you when you give your life to the Lord Jesus, when you become a Christian? Anybody? What happens to you? Sorry? You become a new person. You're born again. Yeah? You change. You're born again. You become a new person. But did I become a new person in what I looked like? No. So this, unfortunately, doesn't change. Uh, we, ke- we have to keep this a while longer uh, until we go to eternity. So this body remains unchanged when I become a Christian. But my spirit is born again. Yes? I'm born again of the Spirit, born again of the Spirit. We read it, uh, Jesus telling, saying that we need to be born again. This is the only way to commune with God. We need to be born again of the Spirit, born again of the Spirit. And I feel, I felt God say to me, this is an identity thing that we need to re-understand and remember. We know we talk about identity, we talk about being sons and daughters, that's great, we, we're recapturing that really, that's who we are. But this is another identity piece, the fact that we are actually spirit. We are spiritual beings. We are not just this flesh. This is not just what we are. Now, you can say we body, mind, and spirit, but let's just think of, of flesh and spirit. Galatians 5, I'm going to read in a moment, talks about the flesh and the spirit. And we are men and women of the spirit. When we die, this thing dies and is finished, but our spirit lives on. Our spirit continues, and our spirit will live clothed again in a new body for eternity. And I think we forget that we are spiritual beings. We are spiritual beings, and we call to actually walk in the spirit. As we're captivated by Jesus, we call to be in the Spirit, in that way, again and again and again. It's as we live walking in the Spirit that we will find these things of the flesh actually changing. You'll find the way that we live changes. The way that we live changes. I think I, you know, being spiritual is something that can be hard to understand. After I'd been saved in the 80s, in the 90s, we had what was called the Toronto Blessing where there was amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And we had that on our church in Cape Town. We had awesome times. We would have um, River of God meetings, and um, everybody would be on the floor, uh, would be laughing, would be uh, totally overpowered by the Spirit. They were awesome, amazing times. But they are not it. They, they are not the be-all and end-all of being in the Spirit, because actually we call to walk in the Spirit. We call to encounter God in those times, but then to walk in the Spirit day after day after day after day. Walking in the Spirit is a total abandonment to Jesus. That means we live each day led and guided by the Holy Spirit. There's an amazing example of this. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Azusa Street Revival, uh, which happened, I've jotted down the dates. It happened from April 1906 to November 1909. Three and a half years, this warehouse in Los Angeles, California, there was this amazing outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There were incredible healings. Everything you can think of uh, was healed. In fact, tumors and lumps and things would fall off people so much so that they had to have people walking around to sweep up the lumps that were falling out of people because tumors and all sorts of things would just fall out and and they'd have to sweep them up. There was such amazing presence of God that there was this cloud in the building. It's the only way they could describe it, as, as a cloud. They tried to bottle it, but they couldn't keep it. 
it was just this thick denseness. There, were, there, were fire, there was fire coming up from the building that people standing outside at times could see a fire. The fire brigade was called apparently many times. See this fire going up out of the building, up to heaven and down. I mean, it's just incredible. This guy Seymour, he was the guy that God used to, to bring about this revival. Do you know what he used to do? So he, he lived upstairs, and he would, he would take time in prayer. He would come downstairs when there was a, a meeting, and he would sit down in the front with a box on his head. He'd sit with a box on his head. I think you'd laugh at me if I did that on a Sunday morning. But he would sit with a box on his head until God told him to take off the box and start to minister. Sometimes he'd sit for hours with a box on his head. Can you imagine? Here in this room, you come in for your Sunday morning meeting. I'm sitting here. James is sitting here with a box on our head. And we just sit and, and we wait. And actually, some things would start to happen. But then he'd take the box off his head and he'd say, all those people over there, you healed. And phew, they healed. Now, that might be extreme, you think. But that was walking in the Spirit. He was walking in the Spirit. He was totally obedient to what God was saying. Totally obedient. That he looked like an idiot with a box on his head. And in fact, I, th it, I think, they're not totally clear, but it seemed like things ended when he started, it's hard to say, maybe it's like the flesh took over, he thought, oh, this is stupid, he stopped putting the box on his head, and things stopped happening. You see, what are we captivated by? Is it Jesus? Is it Jesus, or is it by things of the flesh? Are we in the spirit, or are we living in the flesh? And Galatians 5 Verse 16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now, we can look at that list and we think, idolatry, witchcraft, we don't do any of that. I don't, you know, debauchery, we haven't had an orgy in some time, <laughs> so we don't do any of that. Um, maybe things get a bit closer to home, we think of hatred, we think of factions, envy, but those are just some words describing it. We know what are the things of the flesh. Is it the flesh that's driving me? Ego. Is it, is it my, my position? Is that fed by things of the flesh? My, my job and, you know, my, how important I am. Those are things of the flesh. And it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. We've crucified the flesh. It's been crucified on the cross with Jesus Christ. And now we call to live by the Spirit. And maybe if you, if you don't know, if you're not a Christian this morning, this might all be totally new to you because you're telling me you could be thinking that Christianity is just about a love affair with Jesus. Yes, that's all it is. It's about a love affair with Jesus. It's not about duty and rules and regulations. It's about a love affair with Jesus. It's about you falling in love with Jesus. That is all you have to do, actually. And as you fall in love with Him, you confess Him as Lord and Savior, your life has changed, and your spirit is born again. It comes alive, and now you can walk in the Spirit. So we have a choice. We have a choice of walking by the flesh or walking by the Spirit. Are we going to let our spirits focus on Jesus and be one again by Him? Are we going to walk 
in the reality of that? Or are we going to walk in the flesh? We have a choice to make. And it's a choice that comes daily. It's a choice that comes hourly. It's a choice that comes every minute, in a sense. What am I going to do now? I'm going to live by the flesh. I'm going to live by the Spirit.